Welcome to another episode of Jim's Along the Garden. Okay, so now it's time to pot up the um, broccoli. Now this is the second batch of broccoli that's been grown. Obviously the first batch, I'll put a, a, a quick clip in in a moment, um, of the ones that are grown at the moment are kind of this big now. So they're about sort of 18 inches tall and probably about sort of best part 16 inches across. Um, so they'll be coming into um, sort of, you know, sort of start to grow the florets in the next week or so. So what I'm going to be doing is this is the second batch which is going to go into the ground next to them and then as soon as I potted these up and put them in the ground then obviously the third batch will go in and what this does is it gives you a succession of broccoli going through the year and the only way to do this is to plant these about every five to six weeks during the season. Broccoli will come to um, sort of from seed to actually you picking it in about 12 to 16 weeks dependent on the variety so you need to be planting I'd say every four, five, six weeks dependent on how much ground you've got. I've got two separate um, areas in the garden which I'll be planting this into but um, you know, you need to be, you know, to get a concession of um, crops. Obviously, what I did tell you before when I was planting these, if you do grow a, an F1 variety, then the F1 varieties will come all together. So all 50 of these plants uh, will 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 sort of crop at the same time. If you don't want them to crop at the same time and you want to have some come and then a couple of days later some more, then don't grow an F1 hybrid variety. Um, grow a non-F1 um, variety, F1 hybrid variety, so you then get the sort of difference in plants. But if you grow an F1 variety um, plant of any type, all of the plants will be pretty much identical, so they'll all crop at the same time, or all flower at the same time. Anyway, all we need to do now is to pot these up into these sort of square pots. So I've got a load of square pots here with compost in already. Um, what you need to be doing, as I've explained before, is handle these by the roots. What you don't want to do is handle the plant um, by the by the leaves or the stalk if you can really help help it. If you do need to hold anything then be really gentle because if you if you damage the stalk the plant will never recover from that. If if you damage a leaf it will recover from it. If it's a root it doesn't really matter as long as you you know the sun roots in there. So all I'm going to do is with, with two fingers make a hole roughly the same size as the, um, the 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 plant that's going in and then just all you need to do then is just shake that in um, like that. I'll go for another one so I'll just quickly show you again. So all I'm doing is putting my finger, you can't really see this, but what I'm doing is putting my finger underneath the compost, holding the plant by its roots. Um, a couple of fingers in there, like that, and then just drop the roots in. Quick tap, and then just firm it in like that. And you can very quickly, as you can see, very quickly indeed, you can, you can get into kind of a rhythm of putting them in. And potting them up. Now these will stay in these pots now for probably about another two weeks. Um, this time of year most certainly, I'd, I'd say now more than two weeks. So these are going to go into the open ground. If you haven't got the ground ready or you know all already prepared, now's the time to do that. What you want to be doing is getting the ground ready at least a week or two before you actually plant these in. You want the ground to be nice and firm and you want the plant uh, the, the ground to be nice and fertile. When I plant these out, I typically plant them about a foot apart because I like them to support each other and I find that they grow better that way. Um, but what you can do, if you if you go by the seed packets, I think it probably says you grow these probably 18 inches apart. I grow them a little bit closer than that because I find that works for me because they basically, the way that the florets form, are a little bit smaller but they're also nicer that way to be honest with you. I prefer them that way. But as you can see, I'm, I'm handling all of these plants by the roots. Um, I'm not touching the leaves as such at all. If you plant them into the new compost, uh, you can plant them slightly deeper than, than they were in the original um, seed tray. That's not a problem at all. That'll give the plants a little bit more support. And when you plant them into the ground, again, you can plant them a little bit deeper 
um, in the in the open ground than they were in the pot. So you know, if you do plant them slightly deeper, that's not an issue. Um, that'll actually give the plant a bit more support and probably get the roots a bit more water because they're a bit further down as well. So it'll it'll end up you bit you having a, a much stronger, sturdier, and more stable plant at the end of it. So don't be scared to sort of plant them a bit deeper. But I wouldn't go any deeper than the um, the seed um, leaves. Let me just show you what I mean by that. So if you look at the if you look at the plant, there you go. There's a good plant. So you've got the obviously coming out of the ground there. Then these first two leaves are kind of heart-shaped leaves. They're the seed leaves, and then the first true leaf is this one here. You can see the edges are slightly serrated. What you don't want to do is plant it any deeper than that point there, where the where the first set of leaves are. Um, but you know you can most certainly plant it up into that point. Um, and as I say, when you plant it out into the um, the open ground, you can go even deeper with it, which will give the roots a, a, a bit more sort of moisture because they're further down in the ground. Uh, so you won't need to water them there often. Right, so as soon as I've got all these potted up, I'll give these a good watering. As I say, I'll show these in a couple of weeks' time as soon as they've started to grow. But as soon as you get these in on their own in these pots, they'll grow away really quickly, particularly this time of year. So before you know it, these will be about nine inches tall. At that point, you can put them out into the open ground. Okay, so there the broccoli all watered in. So we've got a good um, 50 plants out of there. So they'll be ready to go in the ground, as I say, in a couple of weeks' time. As soon as they get to kind of nine inches or so tall, that's when um, that's when it's time to uh, plant them out. Now these will all sort of stand up again in a few a few hours time as soon as you start to take on that water. But that's the, what you need to be doing with the broccoli right now. Okay, so this is what the first batch of broccoli looks like at the moment. Now I I grow this in, in inside a tunnel as you can see. I've had a few questions on the uh, the channel recently. So you know, sort of why do I grow them under cover? Um, four main reasons. The first one is uh, we have pigeons. Um, in the area, so pigeons will love to eat all the leaves off um, any type of brassica really, so they will strip the leaves off any brassica within the matter of hours um, so that's the first thing, we also have some chickens running around on the field at times so they will also eat broccoli as well also we get cabbage white, now cabbage white are um, butterflies um, with like, that they're white with a, with a black spot on each wing now they lay their um, sort of eggs underneath the leaves so you'll see that the leaves you know, you know you'll get like a little group of green eggs under there they'll quickly turn into little black caterpillars and then and they too will will eat all of the um, the leaves off your um, brassica so anything like um, cabbage broccoli sp um, kale um, sprouts anything like that they'll eat all the leaves off and then also um, the other reason why I, I put them in the uh, in the what so we also get rabbits here as well so rabbits will also eat the leaves off your any brassicas so it's protected against all of them but the fourth reason is i find that when you grow brassicas underneath this type of netting now this is called um, debris netting it's the netting that's typically used on um, scaffolding uh, to protect you know sort of walkers by from sort of you know bricks coming off old buildings and stuff so they'll put scaffolding around um, a construction site um, you know, on a building or whatever, and then they'll put this stuff up. Uh, you can buy it on the internet, just look for um, debris netting. Uh, and I bought this quite cheaply, it was about um, about 20, uh, no, it was less than that, about £15 to buy the net that did all of this um, tunnel, and also I had a load left over as well, which I kind of patched up that, uh, that other tunnel over there with. Uh, but what I find is, because you've got this netting, it makes the light um, not quite as intense in the um, the tunnel, and so any leafy greens. Um, what you tend to find is the green, the the leaves tend to grow bigger, and also um, um, you, you know they keep the colour. They're not sort of damaged so much by the sun, so it, it provides a little bit of shade for them, and they tend to like that kind of um, environment better than out out in the open ground. So that's the. Um, that's what the broccoli looks like at the moment. Obviously the new ones that have just gone in will, will basically replace these plants as soon as the florets start to form. Now if you look down in the centre here, you can see that the florets is just starting to form in the middle. So I'll start to crop these plants. And you'll see these are an F1 hybrid, so they'll all be pretty much at the same stage as you can see. The florets just starting to form in the bottom. I'll wait till that florets gets to probably about the size of my hand. Um, and I'll crop that, and all of these will be cropped all in one go. And that's going to happen reasonably 
uh, in the next few weeks or so, I'd say. So within a couple of weeks, I'll probably crop all of these plants. Obviously, the chickens will end up with the leaves, even though you can eat those yourself. Uh, but I typically eat the florets and then leave the rest of the plant to the, uh, the chickens. And then on this side, obviously, the kale's growing quite nicely as well at the moment. As you can see, the leaves are quite big. Um, you can see from this one here, you can see how big that leaf is. There's the size of a hand. So it's a good sort of 14, 16 inches across. Uh, from end to end, you can see this one here, how big it's grown out. You know, so if you get the environment right, see that leaf at the back there. Um, if you get the environment right, you know, the uh, the plants will really um, grow well. You can see all the weeds on the ground. Obviously, the weeds grew quite a lot over the last couple of weeks. This has all been hoed down, but so I'm just basically waiting for them to die off now. But this has all been hoed out um, a couple of days ago. But um, that's what the uh, broccoli looks like at the moment. Okay, so this is most certainly the best time of the year to um, go and buy some seeds. So I, um, I've just actually purchased a load of seeds which will actually be used for next year. Uh, but just to, just to let you know what I've bought. So these seeds were on offer from a, a local um, sort of garden centre. And uh, I basically paid, um, I think it was 50p per, per pack of seeds. So I bought some butternut squash seeds as you can see. So these are from the Dere um, um, sort of um, company for seeds. So these are all sort of Dere. But anyway, I've got some butternut squash for next next year. I've got some sunflowers, um, cayenne pepper um, seeds. Um, I've got a couple of varieties of. Um, sorry, no, they're both the same variety of parsnips, white gem. Um, I've got some beetroot, um, Detroit um, beetroot for next year. Um, jalapeno chilies, red onions. Now these were some I was going to grow this year, but couldn't find the seed. But um, anyway, I've got some um, red onion seed for next year. A uh, couple of packets of those. Um, I've got some Alice and Craig, which are the ones that I grew this year. I've still got some seeds from this year actually, but they're um, some more seeds that I've got for next year. Some sweet basil, and then I've got the good old trusty um, tomato. So I've got golden sunrise, which are the ones I'm growing this year. Moneymaker, which I'm growing this year, obviously, and um, Alicante, um, which is which is what I'm not actually growing this year, but um, that's basically the same as Moneymaker. Um, but um, I've got some of those seeds as well. So all of these seeds, um, I've basically paid 50p a packet for. Um, so you know that's really um, good because I've saved a load of money um, for next year's crops. Okay, I thought I'd go through a few questions that have been put on the um, the channel over the last few months. Uh, the first one comes from uh, Nettie Cam, and she says, what type of runner beans do you grow? Now, my runner beans came from my great-grandmother. I've got no idea what variety they are. Um, but I have seen very, very similar runner beans in the, um, in the garden centres and stuff like that. So I don't think they're an unusual sort of variety. But um, I, I've honestly got no idea what variety they were, um, you know, when they were bought years and years ago, well before I was born, so I can't answer your question, but basically I inherited my runner beans from my great-grandmother um, <clears throat> and been growing them ever since, kind of thing. Next question comes from Derbyshire Allotment, um, talking about covering brassicas. Now I did do a quick comment in when I was putting the, uh, the broccoli in the other day, but basically with brassicas I cover them for four good reason. I cover them with cargo net, which you can buy off the eBay or, or, or the internet. It's the, uh, the webbing that they put round um, buildings to stop bricks and stuff falling on the, you know, the sort of ground below just to protect people. Um, and basically, the four reasons why I, um, I put it in. The first one is cabbage white um, butterflies. They've got a tendency of laying eggs underneath the leaves of the, um, the brassicas and then they just basically eat the entire leaf off. And, you know, each, each butterfly can lay, I don't know, 40, 50 eggs on a plant. Um, and then those eggs those eggs all sort of hatch out into caterpillars and then the caterpillars can literally shred a, a plant or a group of plants within you know a, a few days so you need to really keep your eye open on them. Um, second reason are um, pigeons, we have quite a lot of pigeons around here and they've got a tendency of coming down and eating all the, all the brassicas. Thirdly rabbits, they also eat the brassicas so they'll nibble at the stalks and also the leaves and sort of deem the plant useless and then um, the fourth reason is I find that brassicas grow better in shade so the net actually gives you um, that bit of protection now obviously to, 
for um, cabbage white um, butterflies, they can get through, a, you know, sort of net that's got kind of half an inch um, sort of holes in it, if you like. So you need something which is finer than that. So either the white, you know, really fine sort of insect mesh, or um, that that debris net does really nicely. But you need, um, you know, sort of eighth of an inch or smaller to stop the butterflies getting through. Uh, next question comes from Fiona and says, "How to sew the brassica net together?" Right. I sewed the net together in in two ways. I bought it in strips, and the strips were about um, sort of three meters wide or something like that. So what's three meters? Uh, roughly. I don't know, 10, 11 foot wide, um, but I needed more than that obviously to reach all the way over. So what I did is I sewed, um, I sewed two um, pieces together uh, with a sewing machine. Basically, all I did is I sewed it together, put the two pieces together, and then sewed it along the edge, and then I basically folded it back and then sewed it again twice again the other way. Um, so it's sewn three times. But the important thing is, um, you need to sew with nylon. Um, thread. Don't use normal cotton because within 12 months that will have rotted. As soon as it gets wet, it'll have rotted and you know it'll start to fall apart. So what you need to do is buy yourself some nylon thread. Um, I found that nylon thread went fine through my um, sewing machine. Obviously, you need to put it on the bobbin and also through the needle, so both sides are nylon. Um, but I found that worked really well. And then when I put it on the frame, I put the whole piece around the frame, um, and then I tied it at the bottom with cable ties all the way along to. To, you know to pull it taut and then at each end what I did is I cut a piece um, out of one single piece to you know for the arch sort of side front and back and obviously cut and square out for the door at one end and then I sewed the piece that's you know going along the length of it with the side pieces by hand I basically just got a needle with the same nylon cotton um, and then I basically sewed um, up the, the two pieces together and whilst I was doing it I was pulling it taut um, what I did do, as I say, with the with, with the piece that goes long ways, I tied it along all the way along the bottom with cable ties to pull it taut, and then I pulled it taut um, um, on the you know the sort of the gable ends of it as well. And then as I was sewing it, as soon as I'd sewn past a piece, I've pulled the cable tie out. So there's no cable ties there now at all. But what I did do was uh, just just hold it in place with with cable ties because what you don't want to do is have to worry about tensioning it and sewing it at the same time. If you tension it up with cable ties, which will pass through the netting, you can sew it up and then just pull the cable ties out or just leave them there afterwards. Um, but that's the way I put it together. There is a video on that. If you go back a couple of years, three years ago, uh, there is um, um, somewhere there's a um, uh, there's a video of me sewing it together. Uh, right, the next um, comment comes from Terry um, Patterson and he says, have you got any funny stories about the allotment? Uh, I have been thinking about this. Um, I've, I've made quite a few mistakes in the years, but um, I can't really think of anything that's sort of overly funny. I've had some quite funny vegetables, uh, funny shaped vegetables, novelty shaped vegetables. And I've also um, seen some funny things. I'm not quite sure if they're funny or not. I've known somebody drive a car over an allotment. Um, because he was annoyed with the person who owned the allotment, um, but no, no sort of anecdotal funny stories as such. But I'll, I will think, and if I can think of something, I'll, I'll put it in the next um, next one. Next comment comes from Jack I, um, and he was saying uh, wrong sand, not germinating, possibly salt. So I think he's got some. Um, if I remember correctly from the comment, he's been planting carrots into in, into like sandy soil. You do need to make sure that the sand that you use, uh, you can't use normal building sand, you need to get washed sand. Um, to, be, to be absolutely sure, get it from a garden centre, which is obviously purposely, uh, you know, washed and wherever for plants. But, um, you know, you can get all sorts of things in sand, obviously salt is one if it's taken from a beach, there can be salt in the sand. But also you can get bugs and stuff in the, in the, uh, the sand. So what I would suggest you use is either sand that's, that's used for a, a children's, sand pit which has been washed obviously for you know for children to play with which has obviously been washed properly or gets get sharp sand from a garden centre which is purposely for plants. If you buy if you buy sort of building sand or concrete in sharp sand and stuff like that you can't guarantee where that sand's been. It might have been stacked up in a um, you know a building site or a, a, you know a building depot for a number of years and you, you just don't know what's in it. So um, if I was you, I'd always go to a building site, uh, uh, garden centre and buy it from there rather than buy it from a building uh, merchant, if you like. Okay, the next one 
is from uh, Linda Foster and she said um, sunflowers not germinated. This is more likely than not you're overwatering them um, with um, sunflower seeds. I'm assuming that your seeds are okay. Obviously when you first put the seeds in what you need to do is squeeze the seeds and make sure that you have got a kernel inside them. Because if the sunflower's not germinated, because you get your sunflowers like this, uh, what you need to do is sort of pick the, pick the seeds out and then sort of squeeze the seeds and what you should find is there's a hard core inside like a like a nut or, or, or you know a kernel inside it. If you've not got one of them it means the, that particular part of the sunflower wasn't germinated so that's not going to grow but if you've got a nice one like I've got here which is you know firm to the touch you can you know you can actually feel a mass inside it um, then you know that that's good to plant so assume that the seeds are okay uh, the next thing you need to do is basically plant them um, in, some, in some good compost um, about um, sort of an inch, an inch and a half down. Um, I always put them in those black square pots. And then what you need to do is water them, but don't make them, don't, don't leave them sitting in water. You need to water them and then leave them. Don't, don't keep watering them every day. What I typically do with mine is I water them once, and then I don't water them again until I see them coming out. So you know they've actually started growing, unless it's been really warm. And you perhaps just, just give them a little light bit of water just to keep them moist. But if you water a pot with water, um, even if the top goes dry, if you sort of put your finger in and feel down by where the seed is, you'll find that the compost is still damp and that's all you need to get it to germinate. Um, so the likelihood is, I would say you've overwatered them and the, and the seed unfortunately has been sitting in water and has rotted rather than germinating. Um, all I can suggest to you is if it's not germinated, then obviously, you know, you know try again. I've, I've put seed in before now and it hasn't worked, so you just, you just have another go. Um, the only other possible thing that it could be is it's not warm enough. Um, now, sunflowers should germinate around 10, 15 degrees. Um, so, you know, I don't think it needs to be particularly warm for sunflowers because I've known them growing outside, you know, sort of in March time, you know, end of February, you know, March time, you know, I've actually seen sunflower seeds that have dropped on the floor from the flowers and they've actually started to grow in the allotment. So I know that they don't need particularly warm conditions. That's possible that, that, that when you put them in, it's been a bit too cold for them. Um, and all you need to do then is just basically just leave them. They will grow eventually as soon as it gets warm enough. But uh, what I would suggest you do is put a fresh lot of seed in. Water them once, make sure they're free draining. Don't sit them in water. Um, and then they, you know, they should grow away. Okay, the next question's from um, Alan Turner. And he says, what brand of compost to use? I've used many different types of compost um, in the past. It depends what you're growing. I always typically grow um, using clover because it is a peat-based compost. I know that. And I know people say, oh, you shouldn't use peat. But they, um, clover compost is made from a sustainable source of, of um, peat. Um, but, um, you know, there are many different types of compost on the, um, you know, on the market. A lot of the sort of non, um, non peat based compost I find that you don't get anywhere near as good results. Um, I do prefer, um, you know, from tradition, you, you know, a peat based compost, and I find I get the best um, level of success with that. Um, Levington's another good one, obviously, that's not um, um, always um, based on, on, on um, peat. Um, and the other thing as well that you can use is. is um, sort of loan based ones like John John Innings, you know, they're also good as well. But I find that, you know, pretty much everything that I grow is best with um, clover compost. Um, it, it, it will, you know, if you're potting things up into pots for a long time, um, you know, there's only enough nutrients in there to last sort of three three months or so. So if you're plotting up um, sort of hanging baskets or, 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 or big planters and stuff like that that are going to go all year or more than a year I would suggest you put a bit more fertiliser in there with them just to you know to give it a boost because the, uh, the fertiliser in the compost won't last for more than sort of three or four months but for growing vegetables and flowers and you, you know you know bedded out planter stuff it's it literally is ideal I don't think there's a better one on the market my personal view okay the next one comes from um, Moon Tong NG they said, "Is your greenhouse heated?" No, they're not heated at all. Um, in the in in the past, I have had a heated greenhouse. Um, I have got um, paraffin heaters that I can bring in here, but um, to be honest with you, I find it too expensive and too much of a uh, I wouldn't say fire risk, but it, it's it, it's not really ideal. I think we've got a long enough season um, without putting heaters in the greenhouse. To be honest with you, and if I want to germinate something early, I can always put it in the house and just germinate a few 
plots or trays in there and then bring them into the green as soon as the weather um, gets a bit warmer. But um, to be honest with you, I don't really keep many um, tender plants. In, in years gone by when I was younger I used to keep a lot of fuchsias and that over the winter so also you need to keep a heated greenhouse throughout the winter so um, I used to heat it you know all through the winter to keep my you know my fuchsias alive but um, now I don't grow so many fuchsias and the ones that I have got are hardy anyway um, so you know they you, you know they don't really um, suffer from frost as much as the you know the more tender varieties but no I don't heat the greenhouse as such but what I do do um, is I'll do the Victorian trick where when I'm doing the borders in the in the greenhouse either side of me now, what I do do is I dig in a load of grass cuttings um, along with the chicken manure and stuff like that. And what happens is that as the grass cuttings sort of break down and they'll they'll sort of break down quite quickly over the space of two or three weeks, they'll sort of break down and the bacteria gets in there and they'll start to break down. And as the bacteria is eating its way through the grass and breaking it down, it generates a lot of heat and that will heat the greenhouse. So if you've got a greenhouse, uh, you know, sort of roughly the size of mine or even smaller, then you can afford to put kind of two or three foot borders in to plant your tomatoes in. What I strongly suggest is rather than paying to, to you know, to heat the greenhouse, if you dig in a load of um, grass cuttings in the, um, in the greenhouse borders, that will break down and as that breaks down it generates heat. So as long as you keep the windows shut or, you know, not too open, that will keep the uh, the greenhouse from freezing over um, over the you know you know the more cooler months. Obviously, I'm, I'm not quite sure where you're from in the world. If if you're further north than Britain, you know if you're in Alaska or something like that, then you, you know you're going to need to you know to do something a bit more than uh, what I'm suggesting. But I find that if you've got um, either a large thermal mass, in other words, you've got like a big water butt inside the greenhouse full of water, um, that will store heat in the day. And then give it out at night, and that will stop your greenhouse from freezing at night. Or if you put um, grass cuttings in your greenhouse, as that breaks down, um, they'll they'll sort of give off heat as well. So even if you haven't got borders, what you could do is just put grass cuttings in a bag in the greenhouse, and that will give off heat as well. So that's that's one thing you can try. But uh, but no, I don't I don't have any electric heaters or gas heaters or anything in the greenhouse. Okay, and the final question comes from um, Ray. Um, homegrown veg garden um, and it was more of a comment than anything but he was talking about Wilco's um, what they do to like many other um, shops is towards this time of year um, they will be um, sort of selling off all the seeds that they've got in the in the shop so this is a really good time of year to stock up with seeds for next year because you're going to be able to buy um, sort of seeds from Wilco's for like 10, 20, 30p but instead of paying sort of two or three pound so um, now is a good time to get seeds for either later this year or, or next year you know to you know to really cheap um, price so thanks for all the comments that you put on the channel and um, I'll do another comments channel in another few weeks time so I hope this episode was of some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below and I'll always get back to you and I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Love Garden.